Okay, here we go. Um, so as Rob said, you know, Matt and I are gonna co-present, and we're gonna talk about what it's like to work in an environment where you're really in kind of two states. You've got future modernization efforts underway, and then we have our existing capabilities, which we still have to improve and support. So I'm gonna go over this really quickly because hopefully most of you are from the Northwest, so you probably already know what um, about Nordstrom. I'm gonna ask the question that I ask, how many of you are customers of Nordstrom? Awesome, I love it, thank you. Um, so here's how we think about the properties at Nordstrom. So we have our full price offerings, which are really our full line stores, Nordstrom.com website, our full line mobile apps. So we've got a iPhone app and a Android app. So that's kind of the, the full price component. Plus we acquired a company called Trunk Club. Um, this is a pretty cool offering. Essentially you sign up talk about the style that you prefer, and then a trunk gets shipped to your house. Hopefully matches your style and you keep the merchandise. And um, we launched that for women in the fall of last year too, so you can do, do both. And we opened stores in Canada this year for the first time, including Vancouver, which is a beautiful store, so if you get a chance to go up there, it's gorgeous. Um, then we have our off-price offering, which is our rack stores, NordstromRack.com, and then Holtlook, which is kind of a flash sale capability in the digital space as well. So as you can imagine, in most retail um, organizations, technology is a strategic enabler. So for us, it's all about speed, reliability, um, and really taking our in-store experience, when you shop our stores, it's very high touch, um, having that show up in the digital context as well. So extending that experience into the digital space. It's kind of the flip in the digital space. We're very convenient, free shipping. It's very easy to shop our digital properties. Um, not so easy to do that in the stores. If you go in the stores, you wanna do a quick return or exchange, it's not super seamless. So kind of trying to bridge that gap between digital and brick and mortar. And um, reliability is also a focus for us. Um, so I'm gonna ask Matt to come up here. Where's Polly, is Polly here? Polly, hi. Um, yesterday you had made a comment in your presentation about finding an example of where product management and kind of development and engineering have kind of a high performing relationship. So I'm super excited because Matt's gonna talk about this case study, which is a really good example of where that bridge has been connected, so. Sorry, I'm like 10 feet tall. Let's see how this works. Awesome to see you. such a great turnout here, you guys. Really excited to see you all here. Um, so, like Rob said, my name is Matt Hornsby. Uh, I am a uh, principal engineer at Nordstrom, and I was working uh, for about the last year and a half on modernizing uh, a big portion of the Nordstrom website. Um, this is the product page where all of our uh, purchases go through. It's where everybody goes to click on the button to add things to their shopping bag, and so it's, uh, it was a big undertaking. We went from a very, uh, a very kind of old and crusty legacy system uh, and, and modernized it. Um, so I know what you're thinking. He doesn't look like an engineer or a manager. He looks like a male model, I know. <laughs> what, can, what can he tell me about DevOps? I get that almost every day, that question. I, actually, I just bought this shirt for this, so this is not. This is what working at a top fashion retailer does to you. It, it breaks all the engineering molds and stereotypes. Okay, so I haven't done this uh, presentation with Courtney. This is the first time, so I may go a little off script here, um, but I'm gonna try to keep it on on uh, track here. Um, like Courtney said, there's a lot of technical stuff that we can talk about here, and I would be happy to go into any questions that you have. I'll be here, uh, we can do some q and A. I I can also uh, talk to you guys after the fact, but one of the things I really wanted to spend some time talking to you about was uh, a, a little bit of the journey that we went through, but really uh, not so much the technical aspect of this. Um, 
I found that the technical part of getting uh, a, a, a DevOps movement going on a team is actually the easy part. The hard part is the people. The hard part's getting the team functioning properly. Um, there's a secret sauce that when it comes together, it is really powerful and it's really amazing to see. And, and uh, we had a good case study on this uh, in, in transforming this product page. Deal. All right, here we go. So, uh, as you can imagine, uh, Nordstrom's website is pretty, it's, there's a lot to it. It's been around since, well, like the dawn of the internet. If you went back, you can look at the Wayback Machine and you can see Nordstrom's website in 1994. Uh, it looked pretty awesome by 1994 standards. Um, not so amazing in now, today's standards. Um, but it's been around for a long time, and we've built things uh, over time, and we've had a lot of legacy stuff creep up over the years. Uh, this is a website built on classic ASP, and it's gone through a bunch of machinations to get it up to where it is today, which is still in a hybrid state. So uh, one of the challenges that we had here was how, how do we take this and make it take parts of the site? How do we find some success in modernizing the, the site in a way that we can actually sustain and that doesn't completely bog us down and make us throw our hands up and give up. So this is a sort of a long quote. I, I won't make you read all of it, but this is one of my favorite thoughts uh, by Christopher Alexander, um, one of my favorite set of books. Uh, he wrote A Timeless Way of Building um, and A Pattern Language and a couple of other ones there. Uh, but this really sums up the the aspect of how we went about doing this. Uh, and really what he's talking about here is you need to have regions that are able to be self-governing. You need to be able to carve off boundaries around things so that people can solve their own problems, so that teams can solve their own environmental issues. And what I love here is he, he mentions that uh, if, there, if there's just arbitrary communication patterns, arbitrary ownership over things, uh, it makes it almost impossible to solve problems in a regional effective way on teams. Uh, so one of the things that I find really interesting about this is um, how many of you, th this has been a sort of a, a topic that's come up a lot recently. How many of you are familiar with Conway's Law? Okay, most of you. Uh, one of the things that's interesting there, Conway's Law essentially was an observation that was made, um, I think it, it's been around for a while, at least 20 years, the thought was uh, if you have a company or a team that is designing something, it doesn't have to be software, but if you're designing systems, you are bound to create systems that mirror the communication and political structures of the teams themselves. So the idea is if you have really siloed, walled off teams that don't talk to each other, they're gonna create software that is really siloed and walled off and doesn't talk to each other. The old joke is like, if you have uh, a team that creates a compiler and there's three different teams working on it, you'll end up with a three pass compiler, right? So um, if you look at some of the, the companies out there, uh, you can see how this takes place. And I think most people have seen this in practice in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, if you look at something like Facebook, they don't really have a hierarchical structure. They have sort of a network of people, a graph, of uh, a social graph, if you will, in, inside of their uh, company. And so if you look at their software, it's really based around that. It's based around the social graph, the social network. Uh, everything talks to each other. If you look at, if you go on Facebook, there's not a lot of cohesion in the, the functionality on the site. It's sort of all a whole bunch of things and it's all based around the social graph. Um, and if you look at something like Apple, when Steve Jobs was still alive, it was like, you would look at it and it was sort of, the graph would be, there's a circle of a whole bunch of people and then Steve Jobs right in the middle and everything went through him. And so you see that in, uh, in Apple's ecosystem and in their applications. Uh, everything is very walled off and walled guard and all of that stuff. Um, so this is super important and Conway's law, you can put it to use. It's not just an observation, it's not just like an office space moment where it's like, ha ha, that's, yeah, we've all seen that. You can make this work for you. 
this is the thing that is so powerful about it. And this is what we did uh, on the Nordstrom website. And I've taken teams before and split off sub components of teams and actually moved them to different parts of the building when I wanted to build software that was uh, very uh, cohesive and I wanted it to be walled off. So you can do this and it's really powerful just uh, the fact of moving people somewhere else. Uh, it, just down the hallway or to a different floor or a different part of the building can be really powerful. I'll make sure I'm not going on too long here. Uh, so this is very, this is a very powerful aspect uh, to getting sort of the DevOps movement and culture working. You have to give teams the ability to make local decisions. Uh, wall off the teams if you can. Give them something that they have 100% autonomy on. Um, it gives the teams freedom to not get bogged down and not, in our case, not get uh, bogged down in the, the quagmire of our legacy system, right? So we had a lot of different stuff going on and if we had to worry about all of the other pieces of the, the puzzle, we never would have gotten anywhere on there. Um, so the team had nearly 100% autonomy, like soup to nuts. Uh, they built out their own pipelines for uh, deployment, their own CI CD pipelines. We built it off uh, on Go and uh, we're mainly uh, Windows based for what we were doing. So there's a lot of PowerShell, uh, a lot of CloudFormation stuff for AWS, but they built it out. And we had, this was an interesting phenomenon because we had a lot of different teams working in this space and running alongside each other, uh, sitting next to each other in some cases, and they were doing things differently. We had the team I worked on uh, built out their own pipelines and their own automation. We had teams that were sitting next to us doing their own thing, uh, doing it a, a slightly different way. And having that autonomy uh, built the culture of the team in such a way that they felt empowered to do it all, to do everything and to own the, the fate of the software. So part of this was uh, also a uh, an emphasis on continuous improvement for the team. So they owned all of this. They owned uh, the delivery, they owned the automation of the, the pipelines, they owned when they deployed things to production. Um, and one of the key things that we were looking to get away from uh, was a very painful, lengthy, uh, five-week delivery cycle. And it's kind of funny, because if we went back four or five years and we said, oh man, uh, how often are you delivering? You're delivering every five weeks? That's amazing, right? Uh, teams were deploying things every few months, every six months, and yet, here we are today talking about doing multiple deliveries a day. So uh, the, the path that we went down was we broke away from a five-week delivery cycle, very uh, heavy with process, to delivering on-demand, feature by feature, flowing through a pipeline every day, multiple times per day. So some of, the, some of this I covered, uh, I won't go into it too much here, but we we treated, we moved away from sort of a centrally managed team to ownership on the team of everything, all of the, all of the delivery, and also support as well. So no more offshore support, no more centralized uh, support team. We owned it all. People uh, were get, started getting paged as soon as we went live with this. And uh, that was also another one of the really key behavioral shifts here. Once you put this responsibility and accountability on the engineers writing the code, there there is a very definite shift in the cultural behavior of the team. And that's another one of those things that is just so key in, uh, in building out a, a, a delivery team, a DevOps team that is high functioning. So uh, that was one of the, the key things, just that accountability. We gave the team a lot of autonomy and, s and never said no to anything. Um, and in order to build in this, this sense of continuous cultural improvement, uh, we gave the team, uh, as they were on their support rotation, we, we had a, a one-week support rotation that the engineers would take. Uh, they weren't expected to do any work uh, for delivery during that one-week period of time, and they were given the opportunity to build a small improvement for the team every, every week, every time, every week we had somebody doing that. 
and it was a deliverable to help improve the team, improve the automation, improve our monitoring, our alerting, make the team's life better. And so every week we had somebody rotating through that. And so after months of doing this, we just had this a list of amazing improvements that the team was able to make. And it reinforced that culture of, of improvement and ownership on the team. Um, one thing that Courtney mentioned, and uh, I'll, I'll end with this. Um, one of the most important pieces here was having a great relationship with our business partners um, and our product and program management. We had somebody on the team that we didn't have to go for, we didn't have to go talk to somebody in another building, we didn't have to schedule meetings. Uh, we had somebody driving our requirements and working with engineering on the floor, living in our area at all times. And that, that maybe was the, the biggest sort of secret sauce in all of this. It, it's having that relationship and having the person where you can go to them and they will they they represent the business. They're not taking orders. They are working with teams to drive the value. So that allowed us to go from a team that was about taking orders, taking uh, taking work from the business, and having the team now start to deliver value on their own as an individual entity, being able to now an anticipate market trends, anticipate what our customers wanted, and build things out to try out those hypotheses all the time, and not even go talk to the business anymore because they were the business. They became the business customer, uh, and it really shifted the focus away from the technology and over towards how we deliver value to our business. Um, so that's my, uh, that's my really quick lightning talk on this. Um, again, if you guys have any questions about this, I'll be hanging out um, and we can talk in depth about anything that you have here. And if we have some time for q and I'll, I'll come back up and you guys can answer questions. So, or I'll hopefully answer questions, you can ask me them. So with that, I'll give this back to Courtney and uh, she can take you through the rest of the journey. Thanks. All right. I'm gonna fly through a couple of these things. Um, just want to touch on a couple of things that Matt said around kind of behaviors and, and patterns. Um, our traditional kind of behaviors in our environment were boil the ocean. So every time we would look at the website and we would say, well, we can't continue to have, you know, the five-week release cycle, this legacy code base, we would say, well, we got to rewrite all of it now. And what I like about the story and the path that we took with product page and really with our search program as well was carve it off, do something meaningful, learn from it, and then we can extend it further into the organization instead of trying to do it all at once. And the other thing around the product management relationship is the behavior was all about what's the next feature I'm gonna deliver? Like I've just, I don't care about operational excellence. I don't care about, you know, improving the system. I just want to put the next customer experience out. And what I like about the um, team that Matt's a part of is that performance is a feature. Operational stability is a feature. So the product manager that's part of this team understands that, gives the team the capacity and the space to make meaningful improvements. And so it really takes that collective mindset in order for this to be successful. So I'm going to jump to, um, so it's wonderful to end up in the state that we have now with our product page, but we also have the existing capability that we can't ignore. Um, so somebody in the audience that um, is very, very close to this journey that I'm about to tell, so Chad Curry, can you raise your hand? So Chad um, is going to, you're gonna do open space, right? Okay, so I'm gonna fly through this, but then Chad's gonna do an open space to go deeper on this second part of the story. And this is really about taking this five week release cycle and picking a target condition of reducing that by 20%, so essentially taking a week out of the release cycle and figuring out how to truly problem solve for that because when we started this journey, we had a lot of assumptions around what we needed to be doing differently, and Chad was really leading the team through the exercise of, let's make sure we're solving for the right thing. 
So we started with taking what we called our hardening portion of the release cycle. Um, this is, was two of the five weeks. And essentially, the intent of this two-week period was to prepare for deployment to production. But what it really turned into was extension of the development and test cycle. It was often, um, you know, we were doing performance testing in the last few days. It was a gate to actually deployment. It was really painful. We had a bunch of exceptions because people weren't ready. So we would have these um, processes around approving exceptions. Um, and everything within that two-week period was extremely time-consuming, mostly manual. And the actual production deployment would take multiple days with 24-hour shifts and hundreds of people. So our goal was, let's take a week out of that. Let's really get the hardening exceptions down to something meaningful. Let's take waste out of the system. And I'll give a very personal example. Um, I was required to approve these hardening exceptions, um, which really was um, a rubber stamp because I didn't really have details around what we were pushing. But the team would literally, they wouldn't move forward until I would say it was OK. So we just stopped it. It was like, take that out of the system, and let's see how much we can actually, um, or let me say it differently. I think we thought we were doing some version of risk management, and really, there was no value in my approval being attached to these. And then we wanted to get the production release down to being just a day, so we could do it during the day. We could send people home and um, reduce the burnout within the team. Um, so Ben talked about this yesterday, the value of A3s. Um, this was really challenging to actually make happen. So back all the way up to we kicked off a value stream mapping workshop. We pulled anyone into this workshop who had anything to do with this hardening portion of the release cycle. Mostly the people who actually did the work because you know we wanted to make sure that we honored reality. So we pulled everybody together, documented the process. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference Chad again, because we were going through this, and Chad was, he leads this team. So he's up at the board. He's documenting the pro He's putting the steps in the process and realized that he's not really the person who's actually doing the job. And he checked himself in the moment and said, I should have the person who actually does this work up here documenting it. So when Polly mentioned yesterday kind of that transition from middle manager to middle leader, I think Chad's a good example of recognizing that there is a lot of work that gets done within the teams. And the meaningful way to actually help them is to let them show the work and then figure out how to make it um, less painful for them. So just think it's a I thank him for that, because it would have been real easy to just stay up there and kind of um, continue to document the process. So went through, did a small experiment, removed a bunch of waste, and then kind of, um, I would say, broke the team up into groups so that they could problem solve and do A3s on their own. And essentially, I mean, the punchline is we ended up taking, uh, well, we got to our goal. We took the week out, so we increased. We have an additional release a year, correct? Five additional releases a year. Thank you. I can't do math. Can't do math, and I can't configure PowerPoint. Um, so, um, and it ended up translating to two million, over two million dollars in savings of labor that we no longer have to spend on these releases. So it's a huge win, and the team is going after another twenty percent this year. So this is a graph representing kind of what transpired and where we took the waste out of the system. One of the more controversial decisions that we made was performance testing was a gate to deployment, and we would have mixed results. We'd get, you know, no-go from our performance lab, and then we'd find out that it was really environmental. Like, there wasn't anything in the code. It was the environment, and then we'd go anyways. Sometimes we'd have mixed results, and we would go anyways. Sometimes we would have great results, and we'd go and we'd find something in production. 
So it's like, what problem are we solving by making this a gate? So we actually kind of pushed perf testing to the left and said, non-functional requirement, it should be part of our test cases that we're, that we're leveraging, that they should be automated, they should be running all the time, and we're not gonna have this big ceremony before we go live. So that was one of the big changes. So outcomes, kind of touched on some of these, and Matt touched on these too, it was, you know, it takes behavior change. It takes recognizing that the new shiny capability is absolutely critical to the success, but you can't ignore that you still have this existing, uh, I mean, 50% of our website is still running through this, this cycle and we still need to make improvements against it. Um, it requires engaged leaders, really changes how leaders show up. They need to be actively engaged in the work. They need to know what their teams are doing, not in a micromanage sort of way, but in a way where they can really remove roadblocks when the team needs help. It increases trust across all functional lines. The business trusts more, team trusts more, morale went up. It's like it's way more fun to be done at the end of the day instead of having to do multiple shifts. I mean, Chad can share horror stories about trying to get people to fill out the coverage plan for the release, the <laughs> two-day release. Um, and then the team's really growing. They're learning improvement kata. They're learning these new behaviors and really like how do I do something small and meaningful and really move the needle and understand how to problem solve. Um, so we're gonna, I think, move to questions. And I should have done this at the beginning so you knew Matt's Twitter handle, but here it is now. Um, but I'll have Matt come up on stage again, and if you guys have questions, we'll take a few questions. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the question is, uh, did we have to bring in new people, or how did we go about uh, taking the existing engineers uh, and, and mature them kind of in this process? Is that, okay. Uh, this is one of the interesting bits of this. We did not build a team with this in mind. We took existing engineering folks on the ground that had been at, with the company for a long time. Uh, and we also sort of were in this interesting situation where we had uh, a sort of hodgepodge of different types of folks. So we have a, a lot of uh, people that we've got that are FTEs that came from different places in the company. Uh, I had engineers, testers, PMs, all living in the same place. Uh, they didn't all report up to me. I think at one point my team consisted of folks that reported to like four different managers. But they were my team and we treated them as one team. I did basically all of their sort of the HR management types of stuff and treated them all as one team even though it, we had maybe not the most uh, efficient sort of reporting structure. Uh, they were one cohesive unit. So we had. Uh, offshore contractors, FTEs, testers from multiple different parts of the organization, which if I were to start off and say, I want to build a team that's going to be highly functioning, maybe that wouldn't be the approach that I would take, but we were super successful with it anyways. So I think that uh, some of the things I mentioned before about how you build the culture and how you wall the team off and how you treat them with, uh, with complete autonomy to get the work done is is really important in leading a team through this. Uh, there was, um, there, it, I've worked in a lot of big organizations where the tendency is for the business to treat sort of the engineers as the doers and not the problem solvers, not the solutioners. Uh, often we're come to with a solution in mind and thought of as, okay, here, implement this. You're an implementation team. And so actually one of the, one of the harder aspects to this was not just getting the team itself to focus on this idea and really embrace this idea that no, you, you actually can do all this stuff. You don't have to ask permission. You can do this. That was hard, but what was also hard was, uh, more hard I would say, is convincing or influencing the teams around us uh, and things like you know, program management and parts of the business that were not used to that flow and having them think of us as being part of the solution. Engage engineering. I mean, 
the, what I always say is engineers are not people that you just bring in to implement a, pro, a, 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 sol a solution to a problem, right? Most of the people probably in this room and all the engineering folks that I've ever worked with have always been people that love problem solving. We just use software to do it because it's very malleable and it's applicable to so many different things. But bring engineering further up. Bring engineering and throw them at the problem instead of handing them a solution and then give the team autonomy to implement that solution. So this is how we move through. It's really a cultural thing. It's, uh, it's taking people that maybe didn't come into the company thinking they were ever going to work on a team like this um, and, and building that culture and building the trust, building the team's ability to, to deliver on the things that are the most important thing. Courtney and I will be around afterwards if you want to ask some more questions.